thank you so much for the introductory words, Ayush. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about ZooPass, which uh, I am guessing that almost everyone in this room has probably interacted with at least once. Uh, if you went by the registration desk to pick up your wristband, or if you've been collecting frogs, you've probably been doing that through ZooPass. And I'm going to speak a little bit about the project um, and uh, some of the motivations and experiments that we're hoping to run with it. All right, so let's start off first with a quick one-sentence description of what ZooPass is. So ZooPass is something that I like to think about as a proof of concept hard drive for programmable cryptography. Now this sentence on its own might, make not, might not make too much sense, so let's dig into what each of those components means over the course of this talk. Um, the interface with which you've probably interacted with ZooPass, uh, ZooPass is you've probably seen that it enables you to store and generate proofs about things like event tickets and cryptographic frogs. Those are currently the two things that you can hold in your zoo pass. Okay, so to motivate uh, the construction of zoo pass and the experiment that we're trying to run here, I want folks to consider the following general problem. And the first 40%-ish of this presentation is going to be a little bit carried over from some of the stuff I talked about this, uh, this morning. So bear with me if you've seen this. Um, so we're motivated by the following general problem. Suppose that someone on the internet wants to ask someone else on the internet for some data. Now, arguably, this is sort of like the central problem that the internet is trying to solve in some sense. It's why APIs exist and are designed to be increasingly developer friendly. Um, it's sort of the problem underlying almost all digital communication. So here is how this process generally works today. Suppose that I've got these two parties, party on the right, party on the left, that are trying to pass some data back and forth. This is a simplified diagram of the OAuth protocol. The person on the right is going to ask the person on the left, are you Gubsheep? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to some identity provider, and I'm going to be like, you tell him, Daddy Zuck. And uh, Zuckerberg's going to be like, yes, he is Gubsheep, in his omnipotent uh, robotic voice. Um, and that's sort of a simplified uh, sketch of how OAuth works. There's like a couple of more components here, but this is, this is essentially what's going on. Um, we can take a more complicated uh, query or example of data exchange. Person on the right asks uh, me on the left, what's your credit score? And I might go to some sort of provider like Equifax and say, you tell him, Daddy Equifax. And Equifax will go out and gather a bunch of my data from like a bunch of these data silos or data platforms that have various information on me. It'll crunch that together, and then it will return back to the requester. His credit score is 700. It'll sort of stamp that with the Equifax stamp of approval. The person on the right might be some sort of financial service provider. It might be someone I'm applying to for a loan or like some kind of mortgage, something like that. So both of these are specific instances of this general kind of interaction where the person on the right is going to ask the person on the left, given an arbitrary function f, compute for me the execution of f on some data that you know. That may be some of your personal data. It might be some uh, data that you have about the world. You know, any, any data that you have. Um, and there's sort of two things, there's sort of two cases that might happen in response to abstractly this request from the person on the right for some data. You know, uh, in the happy path, the best case scenario is that, like, some combination of data providers and service operators have the ability to respond to that request, and they'll say, here's what you need to know about Gubsheep in response to that query. But in the unhappy path, uh, abstractly, these queries might return a response of operation not allowed, or that API does not exist, or that data is actually split amongst 10 providers who don't have a licensing agreement or sufficient trust between them. And so one claim that I might make weekly here is that, you know, we're, we're probably in a place where for 90% plus of the interesting or useful queries that folks could make for data on the internet, we're probably in this second world. And even in the best case scenario, we're in this first world, like that's still not amazing. This is not like, you know, exactly a, a, a picture of modularity, composability, you know, user controlledness, et cetera. So, I sort of think about this as like the myth of consensual digital communication, where uh, 
you know, when two people want to communicate on the internet, there's not actually just two parties that need to uh, consent to that. You know, there's oftentimes a third party, uh, which needs to be like, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm down for this data to be transferred as well, to be communicated as well. Okay, so um, now I want to talk a little bit about what's, what does the world look like with programmable cryptography? Well, it's a lot simpler. It's a lot more privacy preserving. It's a lot more modular. Let's say I've got these two parties. Um, the party on the right says, are you a DevConnect attendee? Well, what the party on the left is going to do is they're just going to say yes, and they're going to say that back to the party on the right. Um, in order to do this, uh, they are going to have to incur a little bit of a cryptographic overhead, so they're going to have to pass some sort of cryptographic artifact along with their yes response, so that way the uh, querier can know that this is indeed like a well-formed and correct response to the thing they care about. Um, but this basically works, and you know, the purpose of that, that overhead is essentially going to enable this communication to happen in a much more direct way. You know, so we've got sad Zuck noises over here. Okay, so again, let's take a little bit more of a complicated example. Let's say the party on the right is a financial service provider, and it wants to ask that question again, what's your credit score? Well, in this model with programmable cryptography, the party on the left would go and gather up a bunch of data, you know, on-chain data, off-chain data, whatever, right? This data might look like, you know, signatures from uh, various different service providers, like maybe I've got a signed bank statement from Chase, maybe I've got a storage proof from Ethereum about some financial activity that I've carried out over the last couple of months. Um, point is, they're just going to gather a bunch of their own data, and then they're going to be able to respond, they're going to be able to crunch that data together, do some programmable cryptography on it, and generate a response. So they're going to respond, okay, cool, the answer to your question is 700, and here's like a cryptographic artifact that shows that I did all these things. I got that data from, you know, Chase, HSBC, Ethereum, whatever else. I ran the, uh, you know, public financial model that you expected on the data, and here's my answer. So again, we sort of see this different paradigm for responding to the challenge of answering questions like, given an arbitrary function f, compute for me f of your personal data. And that pattern is, first, I'm going to accumulate a bunch of my data, you know, on-chain, off-chain, whatever, you know, it might be emails, it might be stuff from, like, the IRS, it might be signatures, it might be Merkle proofs, any kind of cryptographically anchored data, and then I'm going to be able to generate uh, a response to whatever kind of query that someone might be wanting to throw my way. So this is approximately what ZooPass aims to be a proof of concept piece of software to carry out. Um, <clears throat> it's an example hard drive for these kinds of uh, building blocks that go into programmable cryptography operations. You know, with your ZooPass, you can collect data from various different sources, or in the kind of like idealized ZooPass, you know, whatever descendant pieces of software or infrastructure exist in the future, you'd be able to pull in your data to your devices or a suite of service providers that you permission, and then in response to any kind of query from any requester that requesters can make without having to talk to the original data sources, without needing API keys, et cetera, you would be able to execute whatever kinds of transformations you want on that data that's coming in. Um, so, Again, this is an example of programmable cryptography, which has been sort of the theme of this conference. Um, this is the technology that makes this kind of a pattern possible for the first time. You know, you can run now these arbitrary transformations on arbitrarily formatted data in response to queries in whatever format a requester wants to make. ZK SNARKs are the most visible example of this kind of programmable cryptography technology today. Of course, they're not the only example, but they're the ones that we're sort of the most aware of in this room right now, and which we might have the most uh, experience at the production or near production level with. Um, and there's, you know, various different subcategories of the kinds of things that you can do with ZK SNARKs that are example of data transformation. So, again, viewed through this kind of lens or perspective, which is also not like the only lens or perspective to view these kinds of technologies, but it is a useful and informative one, I think. Um, you've got things like ZKML, which enables you to run a certain kind of transformation inside of that trapezoid, which is running an ML model or some sort of computational graph on the inputs. Um, you've got things like ZK identity, uh, the idea that there's a certain set of uh, transformations that you would care to make, particularly to make claims about identity data that you possess. You've got things like ZK email, <clears throat> where you're able to tap into the very wide and rich data set of uh, signed emails that exist out in the world that are essentially attested to by our global network of mail servers and service providers. And 
a set of transformations, which might include things like verifying signatures, uh, parsing out the string data in emails, etc. So programmable cryptography, again, moves us from a world where the one kind of statement that I can make is something like I am Alice.eth to a world where we can uh, generate these cryptographic responses that are associated with claims like, you know, I know a private key corresponding to one of these three public keys, and I either possess a signed attestation from one of these identity providers, or during the block with header X, like some fact about my accounts is true, or I have some biometric, which when run through a neural hash has satisfied some other property, you know, more binary predicates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the latter, if you want the latter kind of thing abstractly, you're going to need some sort of programmability. You're gonna need a, a more programmable protocol. So again, another way I think about this in terms of analogy is that if cryptography was um, analogized to a language, the sort of functionality of the language of cryptography that we've had the past 50 years is essentially a language where there's like five sentences that you can say. You know, you've got like five buttons in front of you and you can press like one of the five buttons to say one of those specific things. And now we finally have access to a rich grammar that allows us to string clauses together of arbitrary complexity. Um, so yeah, this is pretty powerful. There's a bunch of advantages to this world that we live in now that is powered by this new up and coming suite of technologies. Uh, users can own their own data. Your data is portable and interoperable across platform boundaries. Uh, the various different centralized actors can't stop you. Um, there, there's also this interesting thing going on with like minimal disclosure and like a sort of principle of least permissions kind of thing. So in theory, you could respond to any query that you receive by just like transparently forwarding along all of your data and then delegating the computation and checking to the requester. But there's many cases where you don't want that, sometimes because of you know, ideological reasons, but also sometimes because of mechanical reasons. It you know, just doesn't really make sense to create the negative externalities that come with sharing your private key. Uh, a private key that's shared everywhere is no longer private. It's something that you would rather be able to make a proof about. Um, from the developer side, this is really interesting as well, because what this means is that uh, you're sort of building a data ecosystem that is much more interoperable and composable, you know, much like uh, we've kind of seen with smart contracts and the blockchain. So third-party developers who want to build something that taps into this rich and composable data ecosystem um, can ask for and make use of data all over the world, held by users, held by different services and organizations, um, without needing to go to Google or Facebook or whoever else to get an API key or to get approved for a developer account, et cetera. Uh, in particular, you've probably, or you've possibly interacted with a number of third-party applications that have been built for DevConnect, such as the ZK-powered Telegram group, the anonymous chat, the anonymous voting, um, and various other functionalities. Uh, and these were built permissionlessly. You know, someone who wanted to build a faucet for DevConnect attendees could simply build a thing that pops open ZooPass, asks users who possess a DevConnect ticket to make a cryptographic proof of their attendance, uh, and then consume that response. They don't need to talk to some sort of DevConnect server or some sort of ZooPass server or whatever. It's a purely client-side user-facing interaction. So if you sort of take this to its logical conclusion, you can kind of imagine a world where programmable cryptography, including things like ZK snarks, including things like you know, consensus over arbitrary operations, unlocks a fundamentally new communications architecture <clears throat> where all data is default interoperable and user control. You know, we're, we might be living in this world where data cannot help but be interoperable. You know, where platform giants cannot strictly enforce these platform boundaries that make it such that your activity is only meaningful within their gates. Okay, so that's sort of the far out thematic, what you might be able to do hypothetically with this technology if it were uh, really, really flexible and really, really good. Let's talk about ZooPass today. Again, ZooPass is really like a toy or proof of concept hard drive for this world. It's meant to sort of demonstrate some of the steps of this pipeline, which will inevitably be split up probably amongst like multiple different, you know, service providers, infrastructure pieces, open source software suites, etc. So this is the world that you might eventually have. Uh, the sort of MVP world of this looks more like this, where essentially there are, uh, let's say like three-ish data sources, practically, that people hook into their zoo passes. There's Frog Crypto, which is a data source that issues you signed pictures of frogs, as many of you have seen. Um, then uh, 
This was also used by Zuzulu for a recent event called ZooConnect that happened right before DevConnect to issue tickets and credentials and those sorts of things. And it was also used by various events at DevConnect Week to issue their tickets. So you can think about each of these issuers as like some sort of you know, box that exists as a web server and responds to user requests. Um, the user might share with that issuer a proof that they have an email address, a certain email address that was registered for DevConnect. And then in, in return, they're issued a ticket that can be consumed by others. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of what the other side of this diagram looks like. So uh, one simple interaction that you've probably had is you've had to register in order to get your wristband. And what this is going to involve is some party on the right formulating some kind of query that they care about, like are you a DevConnect attendee, and you running a bunch of programmable cryptography on the stuff that's like inside this simplified file system. Under the hood, there's like various math that's going on. You know, you're going to translate this claim into some series of you know, mathematical operations, and then you're going to run that inside of some cryptography, and at the end you're going to get uh, this claim, I'm a DevConnect attendee attached to some cryptographic artifact, <clears throat> and that will satisfy the person on the right. Um, another thing, again, that you might have interacted with is the DevConnect Community Hub Telegram chat or the Prog Crypto Telegram chat. In order to join that chat, you had to interact with a Telegram bot called ZooCat. ZooCat is a bot that is run independently. You know, it doesn't have to exist on the same server that's issuing the tickets or that's checking the tickets or anything like that. And in fact, we did have two community members who built ZooCat who were not part of the same team that was building the core ZooPass or part of the team that runs DevConnect ticketing. So using uh, a very simple uh, set of APIs, ZooCat can basically ask you to generate a ZK proof that you are a DevConnect attendee or a Zuzulu resident. Um, and again, that's going to get compiled down into some sort of mathematical claim that then gets run inside of some cryptography. <clears throat> the result is now you can have this Telegram gated, or the, this ZK gated Telegram chat. Telegram does not have to interact with pretix or any server. Telegram, of course, doesn't know anything about DevConnect, but using cryptography, we can build a bridge between this one data source and this other platform. Um, Zoopoll is another example. Uh, of a website that was uh, built by uh, some contributors who were not working actually on the ZooPass or the issuance stuff. Um, and one thing that it does is it integrates a similar auth pattern that ZooCat does, but now inside of a web page. So in a similar kind of flow uh, as OAuth would feel like, but again, that interaction is entirely happening with the user. So in general, Pretty easy to uh, ask for these kinds of, these kinds of claims. Uh, Zoopoll also uses the same pattern for voting. So Zoopoll is essentially going to ask you to prove that you are a DevConnect attendee who has not yet voted on a given proposal. Um, Zoopoll is a tool used by um, Zuzulu and ZooConnect to sort of conduct uh, like, you know, elections and advisory votes and these sorts of things. So there's like a slightly more complex claim that essentially it's going to be asking the user to do. Uh, another one you might have seen is you might have seen the anonymous chat channels in the DevConnect community hub. Um, each of the reactions and each of the posts is some sort of cryptographic data that you can make proofs about. So you could also do things like, let's say you make some uh, suite of anonymous posts, they get some upvotes and reactions, you might be able to prove later on, I'm a DevConnect attendee with at least 10 zoo karma. You know, I can prove that I have those likes on posts that were authored by myself. Um, and this is kind of cool because uh, it reminds me of a project, um, Unirep, that privacy scaling folks uh, were working on for a while where they were testing out a bunch of these like uh, various different flows and we're sort of seeing how putting together, stringing together the right suites of infrastructure can make it easier <clears throat> uh, and, and faster to build these sorts of things. For those of you who have been playing Frog Crypto, uh, there is also a Telegram group now for frog holders where if you ZK prove that you have a frog, you can join this group. And in that group, there's various information and hints about like more biomes and places where you can find frogs. So be on the lookout for the frog holders ZK telegram group. Again, similar pattern as ZooCat. Um, you're gonna make a ZK proof of the frogs. 
And then in the limit case, uh, you sort of imagine a lot of this stuff expanding to the point where you're able to make proofs about arbitrary facts about your social graph to these various platforms. Um, you might imagine a world where we end up with a situation where it feels like there's a canonical social graph that reflects the social graph that we have in reality. And each of these platforms, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Reddit or Instagram or whatever, feels like they're just front ends for this canonical social graph that exists in this distributed cryptographic fashion. And the way that you move these building blocks of that social graph around or take things from one part of the social graph to another is with programmable cryptography. So in general, the idea here is that uh, you're gaining a lot of flexibility, you're gaining a lot of composability when you start to build things using this universal mathematical language rather than relying solely on what you can do with APIs. So there's been various community projects. Um, if you'd like to learn more uh, about how to build these sorts of things, integrate zero knowledge into your own applications, uh, there is a workshop right after this. Um, there's also a block of about 80 minutes tomorrow afternoon where you can hear from some of the folks who have built proofs of concept applications on top of ZooPass. Um, there's also a very short ETH Istanbul workshop uh, on Friday evening. ZooPass itself, uh, as for this project, it's an open source project built by various community members from DevConnect and Zuzulu. And you can learn more and get this information, get links to various repos, um, tutorials, etc., by scanning this QR code. Uh, and of course, the main repository uh, proof carrying data slash ZooPass is open source. Feel free to take a look at it, uh, send a pull request in, et cetera. This is meant to be a sandbox for experimentation with the sorts of things you can do with cryptographic proofs. All right, that's all I have, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. We have time. Sweet. Okay, I'll run back there. Hi, um, I just wanted to first of all congratulate you and uh, there's uh, the, or the team who's doing the SuTEC and SuPest stuff. It's been really fun. Um, so what are the greatest challenges that you have found uh, incorporating into these um, kind of novel applications and um, what are some recommendations that you could, you could give to other builders, other communities that want to implement this kind of technology to fun applications um, like I'm just super excited. I'm probably gonna hack something this weekend using super, super fun. So what's like some tips that you could give, like general tips? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, one of the uh, interesting things that we've found is that I think from the outside and when I was first getting started with zero knowledge, I sort of assumed that the hard part of working with zero knowledge was gonna be all the zero knowledge stuff, you know, like writing the circuits and like understanding math and things like that. Um, but, uh, if I kind of look back at a lot of the uh, applications that uh, I've seen, you know, that folks have used in sort of a consumer capacity over the last couple of years, um, the development pattern reflects something very different. And what I've found is that, you know, this is a really like approximate breakdown, uh, but, you know, only something like, you might spend something like 5% of your time working on like circuits or ZK specific stuff. And then you're probably spending like 15% of your time working on like integrating those kinds of circuit inputs and outputs into your application. And then really you're spending like 80% of your time doing just like vanilla JavaScript or Solidity or, or whatever kinds of programming. And I think that there's a dynamic here that's probably kind of similar to um, what might be going on in like AI or ML engineering where it's like the sexy stuff is like inventing the transformer or like architecting GPT or like some sort of new model. But really like I would, I would be willing to bet that like upwards of like, you know, 98% of ML or data engineering hours are going into stuff like cleaning and formatting the data, like data pipelining, you know, the data storage and life cycle management story, those sorts of things. Um, so that's a quick answer to what I think has been uh, the most, uh, you know, surprising challenge in doing all of this stuff. It turns out it's like pretty vanilla software engineering and how you, how you deal with data. Um, as far as advice for anyone who is interested in building, whether with this framework or, you know, on top of similar ideas or technologies, uh, I would say that, um, you know, what we have found success with in general is uh, with keeping it simple. 
So for example, the frog crypto game is super simple. It's basically, you can press a button once every 15 minutes and like the rest is commentary. The rest is just like a bunch of like flavor text on top. Uh, and already just being able to issue people a ZK friendly frog every 15 minutes and then give them the ability to like make proofs, make ZK proofs about their frogs in a bunch of places, like it's already so much of a tall order to get that working at all that really scoping down and reducing whatever you're building to like the minimum component parts that can be fun or useful or interesting, uh, I think is, is super important. So um, those would be my two thoughts there. Sweet. Testing. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I was thinking about the privacy of, um, you know, the, the the general mechanism where you have a, you know, some third party passes you a function to ask you to, you know, compute that on their behalf. What do you do about the privacy concern about, like, you know, what the output of that function actually represents or what that function is actually doing. Because what if, you know, if the, this other person says, hey, can you compute this thing for my credit score? But actually the output that's supposed to be a credit score is like, you know, encoding my date of birth or something like that. Yeah, this is a really great question. I think it's gonna be one of the really hard like UX questions of the next, you know, decade really of programmable cryptography. And it's somewhat analogous to like, well, you know, when, when MetaMask pops open on a page and shows you a bunch of like hexadecimal numbers, like how are you supposed to know what that means? Um, I don't have the answer to this. I think it's a really important one to think about. Um, for now, what we're doing is uh, the set of cryptographic transforms that you can issue as queries to a zoo pass is actually very, very limited. Now, anyone can add a new cryptographic transform um, by just like sending in a pull request to like add a new circuit and various circuit artifacts. So now ZooPass and requesters can understand like this additional kind of question that you could ask. Um, but, uh, and for each of those, there's a very light review. Again, this is a very like experimental proof of concept project. But there's a light review on things like what does the, the request screen look like when a third party is asking for that kind of data? Um, and for a couple of these proof screens, we've given like a little bit of non-trivial thought to like how do you show what this thing is asking for and like what it's not asking for. In general, this seems like a pretty hard problem though, especially once you get into the realm of like, you don't want like every single instance of data transfer over the internet to require like a user manual approval of a pop-up. Eventually you want to be able to like permission some uh, sort of you know, data consumer to be able to make certain requests for certain kinds of data that you have. And at that point, I think that gets really tricky as well. You have to figure out like what, is, what exactly is like the permissions model. Do you do some like sort of hierarchical model where it's like I grant this application permission to those folders, but only these kinds of ZK proofs or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I think it's an open question. Sweet, we have time for one last question. So maybe I'll just take this one. It's a quick one. Uh, thanks for the talk. Where do you get the hat and how many frogs does it cost? Yeah, so maybe I'll let folks in this room in on a secret. Um, so, okay, first off, the standard rule for the hats is if you get 50 frogs, uh, then you can get a hat from the frog booth. The frog booth generally moves around, so uh, check in the DevConnect community hub for the location of the frog booth and where it's open. Um, someone also obtained a frog costume at some point, so if you find <laughs> the person in the frog costume that's sort of you know, walking around, you'll probably be able to ask them. Um, Tomorrow is the last day of the conference. I think we do have a uh, like pretty decent number of hats left. So I think if you're enthusiastic and promise to wear your hat, you can probably go to the frog booth. And even if you don't exactly have 50 frogs, you might be able to swing a hat. So. Sweet. Thank you so much, Brian. Let's give him a last round of applause. Thank you, Yush. Awesome.